Welcome back, everybody, to the study in the book of Revelation. Today, we are studying Revelation 18, and it's all about Babylon and the fall of Babylon. And uh, so we're just so glad you're here. We're really excited to have everyone that's here on Zoom with us. Thank you for being here live so we can do this recording together and get some input from all of you. I hope you can speak up and give your thoughts as we go along. We're always happy to just join together in this Bible study. And it's a great joy to have you here. So before we get started, Tim, would you have a blessing mm -hmm. on this study? Thank you, Lord, for the privilege of being able to open your word, to have our own copies and be able to share them together uh, with others that are dear to you and us. Thank you for prospering this time. As always, we ask for wisdom, for insight, for a deeper sense of, of love and destiny in you as we share together and, and learn together according to your revelation of this book by your spirit. We praise you and thank you for loving us so very much and guiding us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Well, again, welcome to all of you here on the Zoom with us and welcome to you that'll be watching this later. I hope that the spirit of God can just hit your heart even as you listen to the recording as well. And so as a quick review, I would just kind of like to just quickly review chapter 17, which was the beginning of this section of the book of Revelation, which is the sixth section of the book, and it's Babylon destroyed forever. And of course, last time was uh, the, the uh, Babylon and the hour of trial. And I just wanted to remind us of a couple of things. That, that chapter started with Babylon, you know, just this wicked prostitute, adulterous, full of every vile and evil thing. What did what beast did she ride on? A scarlet beast, which was who? The dragon. Yes, it was a dragon. She actually rode on the dragon. She ruled over the kings of this earth. And Babylon was the old Chaldean capital <laughs> of the, Babylon was a city that was the capital of Chaldea back in the old and the old days. And of course, Babylon was first built by Nimrod, as you know, in Genesis 10, you can read the story. So right out of the chute, Babylon was built right after the flood. In fact, uh, it was Nimrod who was the son of the firstborn of Ham. Ham was the wicked family line and his firstborn son bore uh, Nimrod. And Nimrod built two cities and city centers, the first one being Babylon. And that was over the Chaldeans. So just to remind you of that. So even in the natural, it was over Babylon. In the, so they use that as a symbol for us to understand that it's a symbol. Babylon is a symbol of the kingdom of the world. So this, this section has to do with the kingdom of the world collapsing and being judged eternally by God's wrath, under God's wrath. So we'll see that in this section. There is a fun next chapter is going to be just really exciting because we have the marriage supper of the lamb, the culmination of all things. Oh my goodness, it's going to be wonderful. Mm -hmm. But this is a really important chapter. And so we're going to go into it. But just before, it's just reminding, reminding you that she ruled over, the Babylon ruled over all the kings of the earth. And um, we saw that the king on that fifth trumpet, the abyss, the angel over the abyss opens that abyss and darkness comes out in that fifth trumpet remember and locusts come out of there and it says the king over them was who apollyon nabatum which means destroyer it was the devil himself the dragon he's the king and she is the ruler you might say under riding that king over the, the kingdom of the world <clears throat> and so Basically, there's tests before judgment falls. I just want to mention this because we're going to just briefly touch the hour trial. I just think it's important to review what that was because I want to kind of summarize it because I might have left some people hanging from the last lesson. I just want everyone to think about the hour trial. There's always been a test. Adam in the garden, there was a test. God warned him. There's two trees in the middle of the garden. If you eat of the tree of life, you'll live eternally. If you eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, what you think, you will die eternally. Oh, so he was warned. We know the choice. 
he chose death and plunged the whole human race into death because Satan is the murder from the very beginning and he plunged them into that death, all of us. However, I just wanna say, note that God provided the sacrifice right there in Genesis three, the lamb covered their nakedness and Adam became the, accepted that and through him, the royal line came. Okay, what about the flood? What was the test before the flood? Noah built a ark. That was the place of safety when the sea and the waters would destroy all the wicked. Who warned them? Who Noah. preached? Noah. Noah preached to them. You know, it tells us 120 years he preached. So basically, he warned them. Those inside the ark, the righteous family, Noah's family, eight and all, were inside the ark when judgment fell. And those outside of that ark were destroyed. That was Cain's family, the wicked lineage, okay? Sodom, think about Sodom. Abram, Abraham said, Abram said, if there's 10 people in that city, will you spare it? 10's the number of tests. He says, All if 10 people pass the test, <laughs> we'll spare it. But there weren't even 10 people in the city who were righteous. Who warned that city? Well, Lot, was Lot, did. Lot, Lot did. Lot did. He went out and he told the angel, said, you go out and warn them. So he did. And what did they do? Laughed at him. Those, they laughed at him. The men were perverted sexually in that city. And they were, and they all laughed and said, you're ridiculous. There's no judgment coming. And so we saw there, there was a warning. And what happened? They, what did they have to do? They had a choice to obey God and do what? Leave, come out of that wicked city, Sodom, which was the most wicked city in all of Canaan land, the promised land. They either had to leave the city, and if they stayed in the city, Sodom, what would happen? They'd be destroyed with the plagues. The only people that left were the righteous family, Noah's family. And actually, even one of them looked like they were in the righteous family and wasn't. It was his wife. Remember that. Egypt, very wicked kingdom, represents the whole world, the kingdom of the world. Remember when they were judged? Mm -hmm. what what was the test over what was the test over worship it was over worship were they going to put the blood of the lamb over their household on the doorpost entering into this household to keep the death angel from coming in to this household to kill the firstborn which represented that family would die die or not those in goshen of the Israelites that put the blood over their, or that when the death destroying angel came over, none of their family died, none of their firstborn. It struck Egypt where there was no blood, who disobeyed God, didn't think there'd be a judgment. And guess what? All the firstborn in Egypt died. That family would die out. And sure enough, we see that God's people were delivered out of that wicked kingdom to go to the land and Egypt itself though Pharaoh the king of Egypt and all of his armies were destroyed in the Red Sea so just always notice and there was a warning in fact there were 10 plagues who warned them <laughs> for God had mentioned who warned who warned Egypt <laughs> Moses. Um, Moses yeah Moses with Aaron beside him Moses Aaron, and Aaron didn't, yeah almost speaking but Mo, yeah but Moses and Aaron together two witnesses because two establishes something don't they so we had the two witnesses going there warning them and we saw already the, the two witnesses in revelation were warning the world in in revelation 11 you know between the 6th and 7th plague uh trumpet excuse me <clears throat> so the hour of trial, the, the dragon comes out of the bit. The final decisions are made right before the coming of the Lord when the judgment comes down. When judgment falls on the wicked, the God's people are delivered. And right before this judgment, there's been the warning. We had the, the two witnesses, okay? That was earlier in the book of Revelation. The gospel proclaimed. And then we have here... Um, so it's a decision for the whole world. And the devil comes out of the abyss. We'll see more about this in Revelation 20 to go to his 
to deceive the whole world and go to his destruction. And that final test is over what? The final test is still over worship. 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 Are you going to worship God or worship the kingdom of this world and the beast, you know, and which is the dragon who's the king of it? So who will you worship? Um, we saw some more details about the hour of trial in Daniel 8. If you want to read more about the hour of trial, I don't know if I brought this up in the last lesson, but read Daniel 8. It starts out with talking about the ram and the goat, which is ram is Medo Persian, the goat is Greece, it tells us later on in that, and how that goat yeah. destroys the ram. And out of that goat, there was a big horn coming out and it was broken off. That happened at the cross. The goat represents sin in the Bible. Okay, goat is a sin offering. And so that, that, that horn was broken off. I'm giving you a mini study in, in about three minutes here on, on Daniel, yeah. just to give you some, it has to do with the hour of trial, Daniel 8 does. It moves right into that when that, when that was, that big horn was broken off and the world judged at the cross, then they had four horns that came out and they went to the four winds, four winds of heaven. In other words, it's earthly. It spread everywhere that wickedness started spreading everywhere. And it's interesting in Revelation that kingdom of the world resembles Greece. And out of Greece, by the way, came Plato, his philosophy 300 years before Christ, over 300 years before Christ. And that philosophy of socialism, humanism, all those philosophies, mm -hmm. communism, all come out of Greece. And the thought pattern of Plato, just to let you know, that's where they all originated was right there and that's what the kingdom of the world looks like if you want to get a picture of what socialism and communism do that's the kingdom of the world and their thinking pattern and what the world will resemble the kingdom of the world really does resemble so just as a, an aside so you can see how this does apply to us and so that what happens out of those four there comes a little horn in daniel 8 9 to 26 is the hour of trial that comes upon the whole earth it's described there in Daniel 8. And it says this has to do this little horn, same little horn of Daniel 7 that plucks up three of the 10 horns. Remember, it plucks out life. There's seven horns left and you got the eighth horn. And that's what we talked about last time. You had that eighth horn that comes up out of the abyss to his destruction. It's the Satan himself. Another section on the our trial, you can read it for yourself, it's in Daniel 11, because the king of the north, the ram represents the king of the south, and the king of the north is represented by Greece. And there's a war, there's some good things happening still in this king of this world, there's a fight against evil, but at the last, they sit at the same table. The king of the north and the king of the south sit at the same table. And in Daniel 11, 25, 27 to 35, I'm going to summarize it quickly now moving into today's lesson. I felt like it's important to kind of understand that hour of trial because it really does talk about what brings down, what is the sign of this hour of trial right before the culmination, which we're seeing in this chapter today. We're seeing what happens, the final downfall of Babylon. Now, the actual coming will be next chapter, Dan, Revelation 19. But this is describing the destruction, the final, total, eternal destroying of Babylon. And when Babylon's destroyed, the whole kingdom of this world's destroyed because it's the capital. Yeah. By the way, what's the capital of the heavenly kingdom? What city? Jerusalem. 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 <laughs> oh, real contrast between the new Jerusalem. We'll be seeing it. Oh, my. We have some good chapters coming ahead. I can't wait. <laughs> really talking about doing that. Okay. I'm moving into this, believe it or not. The king of the north and the king of the south sit at the same table. The king of the north, which is Satan, and that his kingdom, he rules, he's at the top, has a heart set against the holy covenant. That's against God's people. Mm -hmm. He shows favor to those who forsake the holy covenant. I'm just quoting a couple of things right out of Daniel 11. It moves 
on into Daniel 31 to 35, just the end of that section, Daniel 11. The people who know their God will firmly resist him. That's God's people. <laughs> They'll firmly resist him. Those wise will instruct many. For a time they will fall by sword, be, by, be, by being burned or captured or plundered. And when they fall, they receive a little help. And many not sincere will join them. There's going to be people among them that claim to be Jews, but are not, even at the end, they'll just kind of join them. They're not sincere. Interesting. It's telling you about this hour trial right before Babylon falls, is destroyed. Some will stumble, doesn't say fall. To be, some of the wise will stumble, says. And see, it doesn't say they fall, they stumble. To be refined, purified, and made spotless until the time of the end. Again and again in the book of Daniel, in Daniel 8 and Daniel 11, talks about the appointed time. And this king of the north is going down, we're not by human hands at the appointed time, appointed time, appointed time. You'll see it again. It's Moed, which is the appointed times of the of the feast, well, there's a pointed time and it's gonna be a pointed of time of the final feast. It's gonna be the marriage supper of the lamb is what it's gonna be. That appointed time is when they fall. <laughs> Interesting, same word, the appointed time. To be refined, purified and made spotless until the time of the end. And that other times refers to that as the appointed time. For it will come at the appointed time. There is a time when all this culminates and we'll, We'll read about the culmination in Revelation 19. In symbolic language, we'll talk about the culmination there. Was that helpful at all? That's my review. I'm sorry to take a little distraction, but I think it might give some more solidification to the hour of trial that we studied last week. I see that for the righteous, that hour of trial is a time of us being purified, made spotless. It is a test. Are we going to stand? and allow the, the suffering, the persecution that comes against God's people. When he had vents his, that king of the north vents his fury against the holy covenant and the abomination that causes desolation is even established in a place it should not be, which is within God's people. There's a lot of people that have turned away. Uh, will we be stand firm? This is my challenge to us about that les lesson last week. Stand firm. When you do nothing else, stand. God can help us stand. Okay. Now, thank you for letting me take an aside for the last 15 minutes or so. <clears throat> we are moving right on. This chapter 18 in Revelation details the punishment of the city of Babylon. And we talked about that city and what it was. So we're going to start with... I'm going to make an assign assignments here. Let's see, Lynn, Revelation 18, 1 to 3, and Patty, Ezekiel 43, 1 to 3, and Janice, Revelation 14, 8, and Gail, Isaiah 34, 8 to 12. And you'll get to do Revelation 18, 4 to 5. Good. Now I got a new testament going on. Okay. <laughs> we'll, we'll skip you to something else. Okay. So, uh, okay. So, <clears throat> so let's go and read this Revelation 18, 1 to 3. Lynn. After this, I saw another angel coming down from heaven. He had great authority and the earth was illuminated by his splendor. With a mighty voice, he shouted, fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a home for demons and a haunt for every evil spirit, a haunt for every unclean and detestable bird. For all the nations have drunk the maddening wine of her adulteries. The kings of the earth committed adultery with her and the merchants of the earth grew rich from her excessive luxuries. So there you go. It's summarizing what we were just talking about Babylon earlier, wasn't it? But notice here, who, who do you think, by the way, who this mighty another angel is? 
Well, with authority, I thought it was Jesus. It has to be Jesus. That's what I thought when I read it. Yeah, yeah it's Jesus. And so I had an interesting thought. <laughs> and I was researching it a little bit today. <laughs> I would have brought it out earlier when I had another angel. This is the this is the last time that another angel is mentioned in the Bible, in the Revelation. It talks about another angel several different times. And the prior, it refers to the prior angel that's mentioned when it talks about another angel. And so I think there's a pattern. In fact, I'm writing a little one page handout on it. <laughs> if you'd be interested, I could post that to the group if you'd yeah. like me to. Okay, I'll type it what, up. What was the uh, verse on that? I didn't get it written down. If we could just say that before we read. Okay. Yeah. Revelation 18, 1 to 3. Is okay. that okay? Yeah, thank you for suggesting that. That's a great idea. So after this, he had he had heard all this. One of the seven angels was showing him the punishment. Come on, we'll show you. And they, they saw this. He saw this. He calls for the, he sees all this. Okay, the chapter 17 is a bunch of looking at a vision. Looking at a vision. Now as the pattern often is, there's a hearing in the scene and a hearing in the scene. So that was what he saw. But here, after he saw that vision, he hears, I saw another angel coming down from heaven. And that's Jesus. And he had great authority. I saw another angel coming down from heaven. Mm. The last angel we saw was clear back in the prior was in Revelation 16, the very seventh angel, the seven angels with the seven bowls of God's wrath at the coming of the Lord. We saw that. And so this is a proclamation just kind of at that time, right before that, you might say, it ties to that judgment that happens in the seventh angel of God's wrath, pouring out the seventh bowl of God's wrath. And that bull of God's wrath is the coming of the Lord. Remember, there's a great hailstorm that the islands flew, disappeared. There was a bunch of stuff. If you want to read the seventh bull of God's wrath. But that was the last angel mentioned in the book. Now, there might be some tie-in with another angel to each other on the another angel straight through. We, I haven't gotten that acronym figured out because there's so many patterns in the book of Revelation. So you understand the depths and the and all the layers it talks again and again about the coming as we know it's not just one time it talks about the coming it's already talked about it talked about it in the seventh the seventh um, trumpet talked about in the seventh bowl of god's wrath it's going to talk about it again so it talks about it so um he had great authority and the earth was illuminated by his splendor with a mighty voice he shouted Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. He has become a home for demons and a haunt for every, okay, sorry. He's coming down from heaven and with great authority. So he has the authority over all authority. There's authority that's been given to the beast. He has authority. He walks this earth in his authority, but nothing's like God's authority. Jesus' authority is over all. So basically, and the earth was illuminated by a splendor. Don't you just love this? We're going to see another thing um, with a mighty voice, he shouted. Boy, this is, this is a proclamation that all have to hear. It's very interesting. If you go back to um, one of the angels, the one, it's in uh, the, the Revelation 14, where those three angels, there's an, another angel. Second and another angel followed the first angel. The first one declares that uh, worship him, like last time it was worship him. Now, this is kind of equivalent to that second angel, which is called another angel. And he says, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, which made all the nations drink the maddening wine of her adulteries. That was in Revelation 14, right before the harvest of the earth. Now we're seeing that very words repeated right here. It's a declaration that the cup of the iniquity of Babylon is full and it is under judgment. Get out of there. You know, it's going to get that in just a minute. It's really interesting. This picture here of Jesus ties into um, 
that great authority ties into Revelation 10, 1 to 3. I think you had that, Patty. That we saw a mighty angel, another mighty angel. Um, Ezekiel 43, 3, 3 to 1, or 1 to 3. Um, Afterward, he brought me to the gate, the gate that faces toward the east. And behold, the glory of the Lord of his God of Israel came from the way of the east. His voice was like the sound of many waters, and the earth shone with his glory. It was like the appearance of the vision which I saw, like the vision which I saw when it came to destroy the city. The visions were like the vision which I saw by the river Chabar, and I fell on my face. So here it is. Did you know Ezekiel was a prophetic to Israel? And in there, we see a lot about the temple. It's interesting that Israel had deserted God. They had set up an abomination that causes desolation in the temple. He's referring to all of Israel, God's people in Ezekiel. And that's where Israel had, a, and when he first comes into that temple, like you mentioned here, Patty, there was a mighty glory of God came into the temple. And he was there when it first came there. But when they just desecrated, had the abomination that causes desolation was set up in the temple. And that city of Jerusalem was all turned against God because of it. What happened? The glory left the temple and there's a bunch of descriptions in the middle of ezekiel a bunch of stuff about what was happening among god's people that was not good sorry didn't put them on silent i'm so sorry um so basically um and so now we see that glory returning the last from about chapter 43 to I think it's 50 chapters in Ezekiel is all about a new temple. Do you know who the new temple is? Well, we are because we're the church and he dwells in us. That's all about the new temple. All those measurements are not some literal measurements of some temple to be built. It's about talking about God's people who are obeying him. Isn't that just the coolest thing when you think about it? And he sees the glory coming to, dis as to destroy the city and establish that temple. Isn't interesting enough? Didn't, didn't, isn't that what it said in Ezekiel 43 there? It seemed to me it was saying that glory was like when he came to what? What did it say in Ezekiel 43 there? I didn't turn to it, so Ezekiel 43. His voice was like the roar of rushing waters, and the land was radiant with his glory. The vision I saw was like the vision I had when I sing, when he came to destroy what? The city. And like the visions I had seen by the Kibar River, and I fell face down. Interesting. When he establishes temple, he destroys the city. And at the end of Ezekiel, mm. at the end of Ezekiel, we're going to see 12 gates to the city. <laughs> we'll talk more about Ezekiel when we get into the chapter of Revelation that kind of equates itself to that. There's some very interesting things in Ezekiel at the end about this temple in heaven and the city, that city. But he destroys Babylon. So this is a parody in a relationship to this, the destruction of the city because he's establishing a new temple. No more evils there. No more worshiping the idols in that place. So does that make sense? I've gone probably too long on it. Revelation 10, 1 to 3 also talks about him coming down, that mighty, another mighty angel, and he sets right what the one of those another mighty angel sets a right foot on the sea and a left foot on the land. That's authority. Now we see that same angel, Jesus. Great authority. Okay, moving right along. He shouted with a mighty voice. That mighty angel shouts with a mighty voice. Revelation 14, 8, Janice. <clears throat> Revelation 
a second angel followed and said, Fallen, fallen is Babylon. Oh, the no, I'm sorry, we're in Reve Revelation 8. You said 14. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, yeah, that is right. You're, you're right. You're right. You're right. <laughs> already, oh, I'm sorry. I already read that one, Janice. I'm going to re reassign you a different one down the road. <laughs> I, I read that one accidentally. I'm sorry. I got ahead of myself. That was Revelation 14. Oh, my goodness. I, I should have reviewed my notes. I'm going to assign you uh, Revelation 18, 4 and 5. <laughs> That'll be your 18, 4 and 5. Okay. Uh, you, but you'll, I'll get to you in a minute. I'm so sorry. Because <laughs> I already covered it. And by the way, that fall in Babylon, it compares the fall to Nineveh in, Na in Nahum 3, the fall of Nineveh. Remember that was the other city mm -hmm. that Nimrod built back in Genesis 10? He built first Babylon and the cities surrounding it. Then he went up north and built another one. And that was Nimrod and then Nineveh. Okay. And there's a fall of Nineveh in Nahum 3 and, and of Edom. Esau's line refused, which it refused the inheritance. The fall of Nineveh, Nahum 3, but the fall of Edom, which is Esau's line, remember he was the firstborn of, of Isaac, and he refused the inheritance. And that is Isaiah 34, 8 to 12. We're going to see some similarities there about the place of detestable birds, unclean, detestable birds, every evil spirit. All these bad things. I think I'm losing everybody. Okay, Gail. Yes. For the Lord has a day of vengeance, a year of retribution to uphold Zion's cause. Edom's streams will be turned into pitch, her dust into burning sulfur. Her land will become blazing pitch. It will not be quenched night or day. Its smoke will rise forever from generation to generation. It will lie desolate. No one will ever pass through it again. The desert owl and the screech owl will possess it. The great owl and the raven will nest there. God will stretch out over Edom, the measuring line of chaos and the plumb line of desolation. Her nobles will be nothing there to be called a kingdom. All of her princes will vanish away. Mm. So there does that sound kind of like what we're starting to see here? You have a desolate land. You mm -hmm. have a, a haunt, home for demon, demons, a haunt for every evil spirit, a haunt for every unclean bird, a detestable bird, the owls and all those in the land. Mm -hmm. Not forever and ever because it'll never be rebuilt. It's desolate. <laughs> it will never be again. That is a similar passage on some of these things. You see, when the cup of iniquity is full, then judgment falls. We talked about that before. A haunt for every evil, every evil detestable bird. Does that kind of tie together, together what we've seen here? Okay, so well, let's move on. The call, so that was the declaration the mighty angel declaring that Babylon is judged. And then we're moving on to the call to God's people. Revelation 18, four and five, and that's yours, Janice. Then I heard another voice from heaven say, come out for my people so that you will not share in her sins, so that you will not receive any of her plagues. For her sins are piled up to heaven, and God has remembered her crimes. Okay. So, what is the call? Come out. Come out from the city. Yep. Does that, does that yeah, remind what, one of those tests in the Old Testament? Yeah, what's interesting is there's three things here for life. To come out of her, my people. Do not share in their sin. Do not, and then you will not receive any of her plagues. That would be life. There's three things there. I like that. That's very, very good. And that's life. If you come out, got to get out of the city. <laughs> Go obey God. Get out of all, all that system. By the way, I forgot to mention this. The beginning of this chapter, the fall of Babylon is an answer to the prayer of the saints. They're saying, how long, oh God? Until you avenge our blood, until you deal with 
this awful evil in the land and the nations around us, surrounding us and the bloodshed that's everywhere. How long until you avenge our blood, oh God? This is the answer. It's an answer to prayer. Well, this, this chapter it can be, it would be depressing unless it, we see it as the answer to prayer mm -hmm. of the saints. So this is a good thing. This is a good thing that evil is destroyed and no more pain, sorrow, and suffering and death. And I like what you said there. I want to come back to where we were, but I just come out of her, my people. I like that, Lynn. Come out of her, my people. Get out of the city. Take this serious. Get out of Babylon. Don't share in her sins. Because if you stay there, you're, you're just participating in that culture. Well, everybody does it this way. I've had people tell me when they lived in Europe one time, we had a, a gal stay with us that parents were in Germany and they were Christian family. And they were allowing their daughter to do things that I would not allow our daughters to do because they were not, we don't do that over here. You know, you don't just, anyway, I won't get into the details what it was, but I called the family and this is, we have to understand we live over here in Europe and that's acceptable here. I says, what culture do we define ourselves by? The Bible or the culture we live in down here? We live in a different culture, by the way. We belong in heaven. Our citizenship is there. I don't care what your citizenship is down here. You're in the kingdom of God. You don't belong here. He says you're even like an alien, a foreigner here. And you're not going to do things like the culture says just because other Christians says, well, we just do it that way. Other Christians do it, so it's fine. Anyway, I'm sorry, getting preaching again. <laughs> so <laughs> you will not receive her plagues. This is a warning to God himself. We, after this, I saw another angel. And now I heard another angel from heaven saying this. He, we saw this angel. We now hear that angel. <laughs> we hear him declaring the previous angel. It just We just saw him. I hear the voice. Come out. I'm warning you. This is the warning. God never judges without a warning. Always. I can tell you other illustrations. I won't get into them. In the Old Testament, Jericho, for one, warned. <laughs> warned before he, the city fell, gave him an escape. There's been warnings that God's given throughout the Bible. Open our ears and listen. I believe right now there's a strong warning going out in the world, don't you? Do you sense a feeling that God is trying to warn people? And there's some of them are saying there's going to be peace and safety. <laughs> there's been many false prophets in the last days, but only a few that there's only some true, the true prophets I believe should be warning us right now, calling us to repentance, to get rid, to not look like the, I, anyway, sorry, I will we'll go on with the lesson. So leave your country. It's interesting. I also, there was another person that was called to leave Babylon. You know who it was? Who was called in the Old Testament to leave the Chaldeans? Babylon was the, was the uh, capital of the Chaldeans. And there was somebody that was called out of that country, the Chaldeans. Abraham. Abraham. <laughs> it's in Genesis 12, 1 and 15, 7. Leave your country, which we find in 15, verse 7, was Ur of the Chaldeans. <laughs> what do you know? Leave Babylon. Get out of that country. I'm going to take you to a land that you don't even know where it is. You just have to mm -hmm. believe in my faith and move with me. Which family do we belong to? And also leave your people. Leave your people. Leave that culture. Leave and your father's house. Leave your natural way of descendant, whoever that is, whether it's Jew or Gentile, leave it. Move into the new bloodline, the son of God bloodline, the new family. Woohoo! <laughs> don't you love this and go to the promised land what's our promised land what did abraham think what about a city he was called to a city he said he looked for a city oh he's looking for a city and what did he do when he was down here living in the promised land in hebrews it tells us abraham isaac and jacob all three lived in tents 
They didn't live in the city, in the promised land. <laughs> because why? They were transitory here. Even though they lived in the promised land down here, it wasn't the promised land, the fullness of the promise. They just lived in tents. Really, it was much more than this. It really was, the, the ultimate was not this. It wasn't Israel down here. Oh, no, 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 no. It was a city. This architect was God himself, a heavenly one. Oh, my. What city is that? New, New Jerusalem. <laughs> the New Jerusalem. If he is looking for it, we're Abraham's kids. That's our destiny too, right? And uh, so, and it's interesting. When God destroyed the cities on the plain, he remembered Abraham and brought Lot out as a catastrophe. It was for Abraham's sake. Because remember, Abraham had a kind of adopted Lot as his son. And Lot is called a righteous man, even though he lived in Sodom and chose that and chose to live there. But it grieved him when he saw the wickedness of the place. And he had to see it up front to the point he was sick and tired of the wickedness. And God rescued him for Abraham's sake. Oh my goodness, we're Abraham's children, heirs according to the promise. God remembered Babylon's crimes and he when he remembers, when God remembers Babylon's crimes, when he remembers something, he does something about it. That's what it means to remember it. Oh, I got it. I'm doing that now. <laughs> okay. Any questions so far? Okay. Revelation 18, 6 to 8. That's Tim. I'm going to make some more assignments here. Tim and Lynn, Jeremiah 17, 18. And let's see here. And Patty, Revelation 18, 9 and 10. And Janice, Revelation 18, 11 and 12. And Gail, Revelation 18, 14 to 19. Okay. 14, 14 what? Revelation 18, mm -hmm. 14 through 19. 19, mm -hmm. okay. Okay. So now we're going to talk about Babylon's judgment as a double portion from her own cup and what that means. Okay, Revelation 18, 6 to 8. It's a continuation of what the, the loud voice from heaven was saying about Babylon here. But I wanted to stop and break it up here. So we're going for the verses four, uh, 6 through 8, Tim, in Revelation 18. Render to her just as she rendered to you, and repay her double according to her works. In the cup which she has mixed, mix double for her. In the measure that she glorified herself and lived luxuriously, in that same measure give her torment and sorrow. For she says in her heart, I, am, I sit as queen and am no widow and will not see sorrow. Therefore, her plagues will come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she will be utterly burned with fire. For strong is the Lord God who, who judges her. Okay, let's just break this down a little bit. First of all, what is the significance of the double destruction? Lynn, uh, I, uh, we see Judah's sin and her destruction when Judah sinned. And God destroyed Judah, which were his people, by the way. But they rejected their God. It's in Jeremiah 17, 18. Why double, double portion from her own cup? Well, they destroyed themselves once and then he destroys them. <laughs> That's how I see it. It's a witness. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> That's true. It could be so. Jeremiah 17, 18, Lynn. You have let, my first, let my persecutors be put to shame, but keep me from shame. Let them be terrified, but keep me from terror. Bring on them the day of disaster. Destroy them with double destruction. Double destruction. And interesting, the double destruction, 
<laughs> it could be that they kind of destroy themselves. We see mm -hmm. destroys themselves and double destruction means it's, it's double, double, you know, you, we're going to see, whoa, whoa, coming up here shortly, you know, whoa, whoa. Uh, con there's a, in contrast, there's a double portion of scripture. A lot of those, uh, I'll be in my notes, uh, contrast, a double portion of blessing. If you want to see them, it's Isaiah 61, seven. And then you have Joseph getting the double blessing of Ephraim. You see that Manasseh had a tribe on both sides of the river, by the way, firstborn of Joseph. Mm -hmm. It was the only one that was split on both sides. It represents Jew and Gentile coming together in one, the firstborn of Joseph. Isn't that interesting? Joseph's the type of Christ. Anyway, I always go on little side rabbits. I'm sorry. My mind just goes that way. We're oh. glad it. I think we lost so, Gail. <laughs> okay. She boasts she will never be destroyed. What is this about her? Mix a double portion from her own cup. In other words, she's going to get all the judgment she's poured out on everybody else. She's judged all the righteous as evil, unjust judge, and she's getting the judgment back on herself. Give her as much torture and grief as the glory and luxury she gave herself. We saw all that last chapter. Um, and then she boasts. In her heart, she boasts. I'm not a widow. Yeah, I got plenty of lovers out there. <laughs> you know, you see this. I will never be destroyed. Does that kind of remind you of the golden image in Daniel 3? Does that remind you of that? Remember Nebuchadnezzar just had a, in Daniel 2, just had a vision of Babylon being the head of gold. And then there was another kingdom that came. That he's told about there'd be some inferior kingdoms coming after the head of gold. Because Babylon's how they think. Like Babylon did of gold, worshipped other gods. What did he do the very next chapter, Nebuchadnezzar? Set an image to the beast, <laughs> which is the kingdom of Babylon, or you might say the king of this world. And what what, what color was it? What metal was it? Gold. Gold from head to head to toe. Does that sound like he thought his kingdom would never be destroyed? Mm. <laughs> kind of sounds the same to me. That's what it smacked with with me. Oh, oh yeah, Babylon will be forever. He's, he's thinking, I'll never mourn. I'm going to be here forever. Therefore, how how swift will the plagues come that will destroy her? One day, one day, death, mourning, and famine. Notice here, what happens to her in that eighth verse? She will be what? Consumed by fire, it says in mine. What does yours say, your translation? Consumed by fire. I think mine's the same as yours. Burned by fire, it says in the New King. Consumed by fire. It's interesting to me that there's a consuming, a fire that consumes. You know, fire, if it burns clear to the ground, it'll burn granite. It'll burn everything. If it's hot enough, it can burn up every single thing. I don't care how whether it's made of rocks or what. It doesn't matter if a fire is hot enough. Some of those fires out in Oregon years ago, you know, they've consumed whole houses clear to the down including every bit of rock in it. A flood leaves debris, a fire burns it up. Just goes up in smoke. For mighty is the Lord God who judges her. Oh my, this is, this is like music to the ears of the saints. Thank you, Jesus, that you have dealt with death and you are yet to do the final blow to the enemy death itself. We are just rejoicing in Jesus. Okay, moving right along. The hour of judgment on Babylon, God's wrath fell on Jesus at the cross to provide salvation in his world. Do you know that? God's wrath fell on him. But the hour of judgment, God's wrath falls on Babylon, on the world, because they're outside of Christ. That's when his wrath is completed, because there's still a wrath to come. People think there's not, a, they don't, they don't want to think about a wrath to come. Well, it's because anyone outside of the altar and covered under Jesus and the blood, the destroying angel of the final wrath of God comes down upon them. 
and it consumes the whole world. That's at the end of the world. At that appointed time, talked about numerous times in the book of Daniel. His book really ties a lot about us because his book was written to the kingdoms of the world. Daniel's was. He was the prophet to the kingdoms. And it was shut up until opened in the book of Revelation. Oh, we got it clear here. It was shut up until the cross. But at the cross, it was made clear. And it's even clear in studying the book of Revelation. I'm starting to understand yet, yeah, Daniel. I never understood Daniel before. I just have to say, studying the book of Revelation has unlocked Daniel. If you study it the other way around, you're going to be confused because it's a locked book. But Revelation unlocks the book of Daniel, in my estimation. That's just what I've discovered. It's, and it's amazing how much I study, understand in the book of Daniel. I never had the foggiest idea what it meant. I'm not saying I have all the answers. I don't. I want to be the first to proclaim that. And I might be wrong on something I'm teaching today. I'm open to hear it. The hour of judgment all falls on Babylon, the world, and all who have rejected God's great salvation in the Lamb. When the wrath of God is completed, all enemies will be destroyed. And the last enemy to be destroyed is death. Yeah. Now we're going to see a pat. We're going to see the kings of the earth. We're going to see three groups. We're going to see the kings of the earth. We're going to see the merchants of the earth, and we're going to see the sailors and all that travel on the sea. Okay, and we're going to just read about each one of those, and we'll be pretty quickly moving along on these. We're going to see a pattern in each of the three groups mentioned, the kings, the merchants, and those of the sea. When they see the city's punishment, Babylon up going up and the smoke going up, like you just one of you just read about back in the Old Testament, the smoke going up, rising forever, but it can't, it can't be rebuilt. When you see smoke going up forever and ever, it means what? In a symbol. Can you rebuild a smoking foundation? Not while it's still smoking. You can't build one. It's a symbol of never being rebuilt. Never again. Mm. That's why the symbol of the smoke ascending forever and ever means forever and ever it will never be rebuilt. Isn't this good news? We're never going to have to face, once, once the coming of the Lord is here, there will never be a shred of evil. Anyway, excuse me. We're moving ahead here. Okay. When we see, when they see the city's punishment, they're all, all of them are terrified and stand afar off. Notice this. All of them weep and mourn. However, albeit maybe for a different reason, <laughs> some of them. And all of them declare a double woe on the city, on that great city. And all of them declare that in one hour, one hour, their judgment, the judgment falls. One hour. All of them. All three of these. So all three are in agreement on this. Now, we're going to move to the kings of the earth. And what would that be? Who would the kings of the earth represent? Those that it represents what? Rule and authority. Yes, rule and authority. So it's not talking about one king or this king or that. The rule and the government of the kingdom of the world, no matter what nation you might happen to be in, the kings of the earth represent that wicked, worldly government. Okay. So Revelation 18, 9 and 10. The kings of the earth who committed fornication and lived luxuriously with her will weep and lament for her. When they see the smoke of her burning, standing at a distance for fear of her torment, saying, alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour your judgment has come. Okay. So what do we see here? When the city of, what are they thinking about it? And you know what? Here are the kings of the earth, and they hated the prostitute. Didn't we have that before somehow earlier? They hated the prostitute. Why do they hate the prostitute? Why do they, why do the kings of the wicked people hate the prostitute? I mean, why did, why was that? Because she had authority over them. 
it was so evil and corrupt and they were always at war. Everything in it is just, it means hate. It, chapter seven. Chapter seven, last chapter, they hate the prop, prostitute. It's not, it's not a good one to be in, in, in one with, <laughs> you know, this is not, it's Bad like, a, it's like a black widow, you know, <laughs> they're going to yeah. get you and kill you in the end. They hate it, but yet they weep. Now they're weeping and mourning, be, mourning because it's going down. Why are they weeping and mourning over it? They're terrified at her torment. They stand far off and they cry out, whoa, whoa, great city. They know they're next. Well, it's a city of power, but that power that they've been, that government, the way they rule, what's happened to their power? If the Babylon falls, what happens to them? Yeah, they fall. They fall. They have no more power authority. It's a domino effect. If the city falls, they fall. Now, I don't know for sure if this is like you're saying, Lynn, this might be Maybe this is kind of how we're going to see things happen at the end and the government's all collapsing around us because it says if they, if God hadn't cut it short for righteousness sake, no one would live. Remember I talked about that in Mark? Jesus mm -hmm. said there wouldn't be one person alive. They, just, they would just implode. They would just kill everybody because they just are that way. They're not after life. They're after death and they're already killing babies and killing people. I mean, seriously, people aren't important. Their power is, their authority. So there it is. That's pretty clear, isn't it? Any other thoughts on this section? Okay. Then we have the merchants of the earth. Who would these people be? The business people, I guess. Yeah, business. A whole world is built on what? Commerce. Commerce, yeah. And it's built on buying and selling and trading the economy. This is the buyers and the sellers. The whole system is buying and selling. It's not based on freely a gift. In contrast, of course, to the kingdom of heaven, which is just, a, it's a gift. It's free. Oh, why would you want to be stuck in a kingdom that you have to have enough money? Not even an issue in God. It's free. Just come and freely get it. I just he can't have a contrast, on. God. He walks on it. He walks on gold. He walks on it. He walks on the gold. I love it. He has all authority over that too. You know, that's good. He walks on it. It's nothing to him. Okay, Janice, read about the merchants of the earth, Revelation 18, 11 to 13. <clears throat> the merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her because no one buys their cargoes anymore. Cargoes of gold, silver, precious stones and pearls, fine linen, purple, silk and scarlet cloth, every sort of citron wood and articles of every kind made of ivory, costly wood, bronze, iron and marble, cargoes of cinnamon and spice, of incense, myrrh and frankincense, of wine and olive oil, of fine flour and wheat, cattle and sheep, horses and carriages, and bodies and souls of men. Wow. You want to stay, you want to just stay, stop there a second and review that, or should we move on to the rest of this? Let's move on to the rest of this and come back and talk about it. Or maybe let's, let's talk about it now, then we'll have you read the rest of it, Janice. Oh, Gail's reading the rest of it. That's right. We're only, we are stopping there. <laughs> okay. I've got to read my notes. I just get ahead of myself sometimes. So the week. I think it's interesting. The last thing they talk about is human slavery. Oh my goodness. This is the thing I underlined in here, the bodies and souls of men. Mm -hmm. They just see it as one more piece of merchandise. People are yeah. just something to be sold or bought or it doesn't matter. Or dispensed with. Dispensed with. Yeah. They just see it as a piece of merchandise. Why are they weeping though? Coming back to the beginning, they weep, they weep and mourn over her wife. Because no, because no one buys their stuff. No one buys their stuff anymore. Mm -hmm. They're not crying and weeping over, you know, empathy or something. An empathy to what's happened to everybody. They're just bad because they can't get any more money. You know, I find it very interesting. In Matthew 6 24, it says, 
You can't serve God and money. You only can serve one. Only one can be your master. There's two masters. There's God and money. And you can't serve both masters, God and money. The only one you can serve. Only one will be your master. So Lord, deliver us from any control by the system of this world. You know. Anyway, so there may be no one buys their cargos anymore. What anything else that bodies and souls of men is just the the gold, silver, and precious stones and pearls, all the wealthy luxuries, mm -hmm. the fine linen, purple silk, and scarlet cloth. The fine wear, spices and wine and olive oil. You have food, you have livestock, you have, livestock, you have sheep and horses. That's what that was, you know, if you had a lot of sheep and horses back in the day, you were quite wealthy. And if you have horses and carriages, you have transportation, you have cars. That was their cars of the day, a horse. Some people had to ride donkeys, you know, but they rode horses, they could get places faster. See what I'm saying? Do you see some similarities to our society? This the symbolism here? Not sure. Do you see kind of this is a description of what the world worships? All the luxuries. And it's, you know, even among friends, sometimes those that have more money are just more exalted. Oh, sit right here. <laughs> you know, sit right here. I'll invite you over, but the poor and the no, no one that can pay you back. Do they get invited? I mean, seriously, let's think about the system of this world and the way it operates. Are you on the list or not? You know. <laughs> and bodies. That reminds me of the slavery that we talked about just now. That's going the worst slavery now is the bodies. And a lot of them are children and souls because you see the bodies they're after the bodies to use and misuse the bodies and it just so hurts the soul the, the heart the mind the will and emotions you see it just totally tears down the kingdoms mm. okay Revelation That's why the title of the movie is a good title for the good news to the sound of freedom. Mm -hmm. Revelation 14. You need to go on to say 14. I think I have my notes in here wrong. Revelation 14 to 17, where the in one hour it comes down. And then we're going to go the second half of 17. I, I have this written on my notes. So Revelation, I'm going to have, Janice, I'm going to go ahead and have you re read Revelation 18. I wrote it wrong in my notes here. 14 through the first half of 17. Okay, I finished reading what it was saying about the merchants of the earth. They will say, the fruit you long for is gone from you. All your riches and splendor have vanished, never to be recovered. The merchants who sold these things and gained their wealth from her will stand far off, terrified at her torment. They will weep and mourn and cry out, woe, woe, O great city, dressed in the linen, purple and scarlet, and glittering with gold, precious stones and pearls. In one hour, such great wealth has been brought to ruin. Notice here. The first one says your doom has come. The rulers say the doom has come. They recognize their, their authority is gone. Now we see your great wealth has been brought to ruin. Did you notice the similarity of great city? It says it describes that great city Babylon, that adulteress, describes her dress. Remember what was significance about her dress? She had fine linen, purple and scarlet. Mm -hmm. What did the purple and scarlet stand for? We talked about that last time. 
Royalty is purple. Royalty. Royalty and the scarlet. What kind of beast was she riding? Scarlet. Dragon, red beast, scarlet beast, a dragon. Mm -hmm. Yes. So you know who she belonged to. <laughs> exactly. She yeah. belongs. I mean, it's real obvious. And she's wearing a, a, a rulership, the purple, and she's wearing the scarlet. These fine, luxurious, the color of them are purple and scarlet. Hmm. There's no guessing who she belongs to. She's definitely on that scarlet beast, belongs to the dragon himself. How can you miss it? Sometimes I've wondered, how can you believe the lies that are being pro propagated? There's a bunch of them being propagated right now <laughs> in which we live. Well, red is the color of communism. <laughs> Maybe there's some similarities. Hmm. Hmm, you wonder. Mm -hmm. Remember, communism comes right out of the Greece thought, Grecian thought from Plato. You can take the trail down. And the red dragon, I've seen it myself in, in the Orient. On the new year, the red dragon, they go through the, at least they did in Vietnam, they went through the city. I was, was there in January where they had their new year, it's about a couple weeks in. This huge dragon that, you know, that they take and long tail and all these people under it, taking it through the city and it's undulating. just undulating through the city. I have seen it with my own eyes, red dragon. I mean, why did they pick red for their dragon? In a, in a land that was very is very heathen in its thinking, pagan. I, I just find that very, very interesting. This uh, continuity of sorts, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I think that there's there's some things in the natural that help us understand and see things in the spiritual, even now. And anyway. In one hour, your great love and thought to me. Okay, the next one is the sea captains and travelers by ship and sailors and all who learn their, their living from the sea. What was the beast that comes out of the sea <laughs> in Revelation 13? You remember? There was a big a beast that came out of the sea. The dragon was standing on the shore of the sea. And out of that sea comes a beast. That looked like the beast in Revelation in Daniel 7. You remember? Starts looks resembles a leopard, which is Greece, and you know, as the and walks around, you know, has the authority of the bear, and then it has speaks like the lion, which is Babylon. That fourth beast, and all that wound up in the fourth beast, the kingdom of the world. Quick review. I know we've slept since we did Revelation 13, but this is the sea. This is how anything that has to do with the sea has to do with then the kingdom of the world, doesn't it? Okay. Gail, Revelation 18, I, I re-signed you a different section. <laughs> it's Revelation, the second half of 17, Gail, through verse 19. 17b through 19. I had it written wrong in my notes. I'm sorry. Starts with every sea captain. Can you, would you please, please unmute, Gail? Okay. Every sea captain and all who travel by the ship, the sailors and all who earn their living from the sea, will stand far off. When they see the smoke of her burning, they will exclaim, was there ever a city like this great city? They will throw dust on their heads and with weeping and mourning, cry out, woe, woe, O great city, where all who had ships on the sea became rich through her wealth. In one hour, she has been brought to ruin. Mm. Said the same thing as the other one. When you're, when you're uh, wearing, you see, it's everything that to do with this kingdom, <laughs> everything to do with this, how this system operates. Any other thoughts on this from any of you? Well, all I know is during COVID, it was a real eye opener to see what happened to the ships at sea. Um, there wasn't anybody available to unload those ships at all these ports. And they had ships over here on the West Coast that were lined up waiting to be unloaded. And oh. there was just nobody to unload them. And they had ships full of cargo that people needed 
they were waiting on electronics and all kinds of things from China. And the big delay was the fact that there was nobody working to unload them. It was a real eye opener to, we underestimate just how much of our goods arrive by, by sea and how much we depend on other countries for the things we use. It's just, I, that is excellent. An, an application of what's happening in the nations and how quickly this could happen. Literally. China, China uh, owns, shall we say, 15 ports. And I believe including the Panama Canal, as well as a couple in Europe. Therefore, that is why there is so much uh, stress, shall we say, with politics and that because they own so many ports for the ships to come through and they can stop it. Yeah. You just can't transport stuff unless you use the sea. So I think it's so interesting. I mean, you'd have to have, it'd be a lot harder to transport some of these very heavy cargoes by a jet. <laughs> And expensive. And expensive? Yeah, you think about the cars, you think about, um, we were waiting for furniture that was delayed seven months yeah. when Brad was sick because you couldn't get it during COVID. Um, wow. wow. We just have no idea. People move around the world and their goods were on that ship. and. You know, there's there's nothing that you can do if there's no one available or a place to put it. They can't, people can't buy it. And it's interesting because I have often, I've debated on this. This whole past, you just, I've, I've wondered about. And I don't have the answers. God knows. Whether in literal reality the whole world comes crashing down kind of like it's symbolized here you know rome by the way anything had to be transported by sea back in the olden days all of it you didn't have a jet flying someplace and it's interesting at the time of jesus birth when the world was judged did you know what there was a great sea you know what that great sea was the Mediterranean and every nation that touched that Mediterranean, including Israel, every nation that touched that sea was controlled by one power and it was Rome. Mm -hmm. All of it. When the world was judged at the cross, everything that surrounded that sea, all the commerce was controlled by Rome. That was the main commerce, that whole area was that great sea. And what river is the main river that flows into that sea? You ever thought of this? No. The Nile. The Egyptian oh. river Nile flows, is the big supplier of the water to that sea. Do you understand? It's so interesting, Patty, that you brought up this thing about what we have seen in the, affecting the whole world, affecting our nation, affected other nations. This was the interesting thing that has happened that seems to me, when I read this, seems to be an eye-opener to the days in which we live. The control of that particular canal during COVID was a big issue politically. It was a really big deal. Commerce was, everybody has a keen interest on that particular passage. Yeah, because you have to get between the Americas that way. Hmm. That's interesting. Well, not just not just the Panama, but the one over in Europe as well, mm -hmm. Suez. The Suez Canal. Yeah. Yeah. You see, there's it's still a really these symbols. Could it be? It's a picture of kind of what starts happening when the world starts coming to its final destruction. Unraveling. As it unraveled. It's groaning, waiting for the sons of God to be revealed. But there's a groaning that happens under that seventh king. Because remember when he wrote the book, John said, the sixth is here, the seventh is yet to come. The dragon will be let out for a short time out of the abyss. 
And he is the eighth king that belongs to those seven kings. And when he's represented by the eight, that little horn that uproots three out of the 10 in Daniel. So there's some parallels here yeah. to the hour of trial that comes upon the world. Now, how that is, and when the final decisions are made, but I'm glad you brought this up because I just believe this is such a time in which we live. It's a time for the saints to rise up and the darkness is going to descend in such a way everywhere in the world. People want to know about what's going to happen. They want to read Revelation and get nations and they want to see one man arising. I believe it's a time we'll see the man of lawlessness revealed like we talked about in the last lesson. That's why I tied the last lesson to this lesson. They do, but they don't want to hear about repentance. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Don't pretend. Just tell me about the end of time. Yeah. <laughs> we wouldn't want to discuss sin. <laughs> and that's the sad part. Do you know, I think, pre I really think preachers would really do well to preach all seven letters given to the church in this prophetic book. I think it wouldn't even hurt for me to read it myself and just be sure I need to repent of anything that's there. The first one being the foremost of all. Have I lost my first love of Jesus? Do I love luxury? Do I love stuff? Do I love my house? Do I love my priorities? Where are my priorities in this day? The whole concept of dying daily to sin is not, not about. being preached. And where is the blood taught? I haven't heard songs about the blood. I've always had, I keep hearing these songs about, I know God will see me through. You know, he's done it before. He'll do it again. Why do you have to tell me that? If you tell me that he's the great and mighty God, that he's exalted above all, you don't have to assure me of the other. If I'm worshiping the mighty, mighty God, <laughs> if I see that he is all sufficient for me, that he's my fortress in the time of storm, why do you have to tell me and keep assuring me that he's going to help me? It's because we're not even worshiping in them in our songs. Excuse me. Oh, man, I've just diverted. I'm you got me on the diversion path. No, it's not you. I got myself on the diversion yeah. path. I will blame you both. My dear friends. <laughs> because you have a heart for this particular topic. <laughs> I do because I've seen, when I've studied the book of Revelation, he's giving us a warning in this book. He's pleading with us to come out of her, my people. This is what we, the people need. God's people need to listen to the warning. And that's you and me. Let's listen to it. Let's come out of Babylon. This is the appeal of this book. Get out of here. This, this is, this is what's going to happen to it. Okay, okay. We, 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 we. <laughs> Thank you, Patty, for bringing that up. Thank, thank you. It's relevant, and it is relevant. It's more relevant than we think, because mm -hmm. it's not the first of the shutdowns. I think we're going to see more and more because mm -hmm. the man of lawlessness must be revealed. We talked mm. about that in Psalms 2. That's the last study last time, Revelation 17. If you haven't heard that study, I would encourage you to go read, listen to the study on the hour of trial, Revelation 17, we did last time. It might be bigger than toilet paper in the future. <laughs> That's a minor comparison. Mm -hmm. I love it, Tim. That's good. Oh, but here's, I want to just say this. This is a little, this is a little thing stuck right in here. I just love this first. Oh, let's see. Here's turn this. Oh, we're reassigning some things. That's yours, Tim. Just a second. Tim is Revelation 18, 20. And Lynn, Jeremiah 51, 35 to 37. And Patty, Revelation 18, 21. Oh, wow, we've got a few more verses to go. We've moved right along here. And Janice, Revelation. Oh, no, we missed one. Oh, in Janice, Re Jeremiah 51, 60 to 64. And Gail, Revelation 18, 22 to 23. And Tim, Revelation 18, 
24. Beth, I, I didn't get the, the verse, Jeremiah. Uh, Jeremiah 51, verses 60 to 64. And what was mine in Jeremiah? It's 35, 51, 35 to 37. Then we have some, what, what, what chapter? Was what was mine? 51. Jeremiah. I, think we were, <laughs> I couldn't hear. Oh, we were okay. under, yeah. Was mine 21 to 22? Okay. Dale, you're in Revelation 18, 22 to 23. Oh, 22 to 23. Okay. Okay. Glad I, okay. okay. <laughs> and what was mine? Because that was cutting out. <laughs> Jeremiah 51, 35 to 37. Okay, thank you. Okay. Did everyone get their verses so we can, we'll move right to you now. Okay, there we go. Okay. Heaven and saints rejoice. I love this verse, Revelation 18, 20, when Babylon comes down totally. And you know, it kind of reminds me of this verse. Lift up your, when you see all these things happening, lift up your heads for your redemption draweth nigh. <laughs> I, I, I just threw that in for good measure. That's an extra good measure right in there. I didn't have it in my notes, but it just pops into me. Look up. When we see these things coming, let's quit focusing on all this and focus on the king. Okay, look, Tim, move it. Focus on the man walking through the storm, the waves. <laughs> He's with you in, the, in a black fiery furnace. <laughs> Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you holy apostles and prophets, for God has avenged you on her. That's New King James. Okay. Time. This one says, Rejoice over her, O heaven. Rejoice, saints and apostles and prophets. God has judged her for the way she treated you. Treated you. <laughs> and I like that avenged you. You know, he's avenged that blood. He has. God calls us to rejoice when evil comes down. God calls us to rejoice when evil comes down. Be glad that God's judging you. Thank you, Jesus. They've had their warning. They've made their mind up at this point. You know what I'm saying? Their hearts are bent on evil, just like Pharaoh of old. He had hardened his heart, would not listen to all the warnings given. And in that, God hardened his heart. And those kings that come against him accomplish the purpose of God, that people make a decision. Let us not harden our hearts like they did in the rebellion. Let's keep them soft towards God. And he also first tells us why. What? 24. Yeah, yeah, we'll get to that in a minute. Okay, that sounds good. So God's, okay, let's move right along in Jeremiah. What did I have in Jeremiah? There's something in Jeremiah that's really tied to this. Jeremiah 51, 35 to 37. I don't remember what it is, but it's tied to this somehow. <laughs> Ask Lynn. Uh, yeah, I'll tell you. <laughs> uh, may the violence done to our flesh be upon Babylon, say the inhabitants of Zion. May our blood be on those who live in Babylonia, says Jerusalem. Therefore, this is what the Lord says. See, I will defend your cause and avenge you. I will dry up her sea and make her springs dry. Babylon will be a heap of ruins, a haunt for jackals, an object of horror and scorn, a place where no one lives. That's what it was. Doesn't that tie together? Mm -hmm. It does. Talking about Babylon back there, we're hearing it here again in this prophecy. I mm -hmm. love it. Then the mighty angel makes a declaration. Oh, don't you just love this. Revelation 18, 21, Patty. Then a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, thus with violence, the great city Babylon shall be thrown down and shall not be found anymore. There, that ties kind of di directly, this picking up the mighty stone who is that mighty angel that picked up the boulder who do you think that is <laughs> that's another angel again <laughs> <laughs> that not mighty, just another when angel. it says mighty angel every time i've noticed in the book of revelation when it puts mighty in front of angel always always jesus be christ <laughs> i just love it okay and cool this is 
a parody on Jeremiah 51, right there, uh, Janice, uh, 60 to 64. I didn't want to read all of Jeremiah 51, so I just picked out a couple of verses. If you want to read all the rest of it another time, you can. But Jeremiah 51, 60 to 64, ties together here, of course, with Babel, this happening. Jeremiah had written on a scroll about all the disasters that would come upon Babylon, all that had been recorded concerning Babylon. He said to Sariah, when you get to Babylon, see that you read all these words aloud, then say, O oh Lord, you have said you will destroy this place so that neither man nor animal will live in it. It will be desolate forever. When you finish reading the scroll, tie a stone to it and throw it into Euphrates. Then say, so will Babylon sink to rise no more. Because of the disaster I will bring upon her, and her people will fall. The words of Jeremiah end here. There you go. Tie that judgment, that scroll of judgment against Babylon. And it goes down at that boulder, throw it in the Euphrates. What is the Euphrates River? Where does it, what, what city does the Euphrates River flow into? Through Babylon. Babylon. Flows through Babylon. It's their water source. It's dried up in preparation for the kings of the earth. And that's part of the reason why, I mean, this is an aside. I always take these little sides, so sorry. But I'm not sorry. Anyway, <laughs> It, what the you real were saying, truth. The truth. But <laughs> what you were saying, Patty, about this, you know, the river Euphrates is dried up yeah. in preparation for the kings, the father and the son from the east to come, coming to the Lord in that sixth plague. Interesting here, we see that drying up. Could that be a literal mm -hmm. drying up of the nations of imploding upon themselves we've seen this always in the past when evil rules the nation goes down mm -hmm. what if that happens around the world what if there's no safe place in them anyway okay <clears throat> never to be found again whatever Nineveh plotted against the lord the lord will bring to an end trouble won't arise a second time it says that about Nineveh too in Nahum 1 9 okay, okay. The finality of Babylon's judgment is described in Revelation 18, verses 22 to 23. And that is Gail's turn. The music of harpists and musicians, flute players and trumpeteers will never be heard in you again. No workman of any trade will ever be found in you again. The sound of a millstone will never be heard in you again. The light of a lamp will never shine in you again. The voice of the bridegroom and bride will never be heard in you again. Your merchants were the world's greatest men. By your magic spell, all the nations were led astray. Wow. Mm. I think that's pretty self-explanatory. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. No more music and dancing. No more trade. No more light. Total darkness. Mm -hmm. Kind of reminds you from before the earth was created, doesn't it? Darkness over the face of the abyss. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The voice of bride and bridegroom never heard again. No more families, no more celebration, no more people. Your merchants were the world's great men. Isn't that interesting? Who was exalted in the land of the kingdom of darkness? The merchants, the ones that made the most money. Mm hmm. With the signs of life goes life itself. And by your magic spell, all the nations will let us pray. Yes, that's true. With the signs of life, life is gone. Um, Revelation 18, 24. And in her was found the blood of prophets and saints and of all who were slain on the earth. Not only talking about the prophets, mm -hmm. but everything that happened from death, everything, mm -hmm. all that have been killed, all the, everyone, mm -hmm. the death in the land, it's all of it, avenged. In her was found the blood of prophet saints and of all who have been killed on the earth. Isn't that interesting? 
I mean, to me, it really does speak something to me. Mm -hmm. Think about Cain and Abel and, and Abel's blood crying out because he worshiped God and he was killed by Cain who would not come and was warned by God, as we know. It was another warning. So we see um, there's an announcement. The, the woman Babylon was drunk with the blood of the saints, the blood of those who bore testimony to Jesus, it said in Revelation 17, 6. And there's an announcement in the middle of the seven bowls of God's wrath. And that's Revelation 16, 4 to 7. Would you read that for us, Lynn? Remember the bowls of God's wrath. And the second and third bowls are judgment against the sea and the rivers. The first was boils on the people, the inhabitants that are refused are full of petrifying, putrefying sores. You know, they're refusing to repent, we see later on. The second and third bowls are judgment against the sea, the rivers, and springs of waters, everything that do with the waters. And there's an announcement between the third and the fourth plague there of the bowls of God's wrath. Then the, this is the final text, Revelation 16, 4 to 7. The third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and springs of water, and they became blood. Then I heard the angel in charge of the waters say, you are just in these judgments, you who are and who were the Holy One, because you have so judged. For they have shed the blood of your saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink as they deserve. And I heard the altar respond, yes, Lord God Almighty, true and just are your judgments. God is the just judge. Oh, thank God we have a holy judge. Mm -hmm. Oh, we thank the Lord. We thank the Lord. We thank him. Satan was the murderer from the beginning. From the very beginning, Jesus said. He's the one that brought death upon this earth. When Adam kneeled, bowed to Satan, death ruled in this land. Oh, thank God. Now his kingdom, at this point, that is the kingdom. His kingdom yeah. would be destroyed, never to rise again. Mm. Rejoice. Oh, my. The next chapter. Saints rejoice. It starts with that mighty doxology in Revelation 19. I'm just telling you, we're going to do that next. Revelation 19. Oh, my, my, my. <laughs> well, before we, before we stop here, any other thing you want to say about what we just studied? Bring it up now. Any <laughs> What? <laughs> on, on Revelation 18, when you go back to verses 23 um, in Revelation 18, I think it's really important here. There's just way too much symbolism. I think that the, the voices of the saints will be silent. I think this is symbolizing even the Christians who were speaking out the believers, there won't be anybody speaking anymore. Our voices will be silent. We won't just be dead. They won't hear the voice of Jesus. Wow. The light of the lamp, the voice of the bridegroom and the bride, his church. I, I think it's really important that there's, there's nobody there to witness to them anymore. You know, our voice is silent. Which the side, uh, side note on mine says uh, lost joy in which that section. Which, which, which verse you were talking about 23? Yeah, in chapter 18, verse 23, it says the light of a lamp shall not shine on you anymore. And the That's voice of the bridegroom and the bride, I, I think that at that point, it's going to be so obvious that there's nobody to speak up for good. For, for the light, for the joy. That is awesome. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for revealing that through Patty. <laughs> it, it just, it just seems so profound to me. Wow. So do you think that this maybe the whole section is referring to the, the bride? I don't know about the previous things, but, but I think in the end, when evil the cup is full and when the cup is full there is no light and and 
God, God has literally turned themselves over to themselves right. and he's removed his light. And, and it, it, I mean, it's another way to describe utter darkness. Yes, the ninth, and that would tie in with the ninth plague in, in yeah. Egypt. The yeah. ninth plague was the second woe because it, the eighth, ninth, and tenth parallel the eighth, ninth, and tenth. But so Jesus is our light, and he is our lamb. He is our bridegroom. I mean, it, it just jumps out that there'll be no more witness. No there, more will be, there will be no voice. There will be no worship either because those instruments are about worship. They're about worship. Yeah. So there's there'll be no worship in them. It's interesting how what you're saying because hmm. it will never be heard in you again, meaning that the wicked, those who will be destroyed, it's not heard in them, but yet it will be heard, of course, in the righteous. So there's a separation. But you, the workman of any trade will never be found in you again. The sound of millstone will never be heard yeah. in you. Millstone, all that has to do with the work. That, you know, that seems to me that has to do with the work down here. I'm, I'm glad for this discussion. It's awesome. There's no rejoicing because there's no music and harpist. And that only happens if you have righteousness abounding. <laughs> you know, prosperity. And, yeah. You know, they've already, they're already putting themselves with throwing dust on their head in mourning. <laughs> yeah interesting it's, it's true and yet god will have his ambassadors <clears throat> on the earth to the end one thing is important to know that there god's people will be on this earth when he comes there is an important he he's not gonna he's not gonna take them all out and they're not gonna be this is saying in babylon, in babylon. this is bad just in babylon yeah god's people have already been called out of babylon yeah we, we're out of babylon yeah that's true we're called out of babylon that's true. That's true. We have been called out of Babylon and God's people aren't in the city anymore. It's yeah. like it's out of the city. Oh, yeah. oh thank you. I just it when the light bulb comes on in my own heart. I and there's no one to speak. There's no one to speak the good. Yes, they brought the 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 righteous have been called out of righteous are called out, called out of Babylon, the city. I'm writing it right in here, so I remember that. That's so good. The city. They don't belong there anymore. We are we are not, we are called out of Babylon. And in that wicked places, we are not. But we're still on this earth until the coming. But the final destruction will happen once we're up there. We'll talk about that in the next chapter. But it is true. I love that. I love it. The light of a lamp will never shine in you again. The NLT says called away from Babylon. So that may not mean that all the righteous are actually in Babylon, but in other words, don't have anything to do with it. Well, symbolically, mm -hmm. symbolically, you, you're still living down here, but you're not part of it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they have rejected the witness. We see that, that they're, they're lying in the great city, which is the city of Babylon. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. they're lying in that great city, which is symbolically called Egypt and Sodom. Where our Lord was crucified. They're lying there and they're rejoicing over the death of the witness because mm -hmm. they've rejected the witness. Wow. But he's keeping his witnesses here until he comes again because he has ambassadors here, but their message has been rejected. Oh Lord, give us the harvest. Father, I just say, give us the harvest. Mm. Excuse me, before I pray, is there anybody else that wanted to comment before I stop the study? <laughs> okay. Thank you for your comments. Thank you for participation today. I hope that all of you that are watching this are blessed. And we're just going to have a prayer of thanking the Lord. Thank mm -hmm. you, Jesus. We rejoice that you deal with evil. We mm -hmm. ask that right now, while we still are in that sixth king, we still have a chance for people to come in. Lord, increase our witness of each one of our lives may they see the light of the life of god just flowing out of us to those around us mm -hmm. lord open opportunities that we can bring them in bring in the lost and may we stand firm and may we know you jesus mm -hmm. know you yes, i pray that everyone that listens to this will stand firm Mm -hmm. to the very end in the mighty name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And we thank you, Father.
We rejoice in you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Yeah.